So I should confess from the outset I'm no expert in coffee, uh, no expert in wine, uh, no sensory expert in anything really, uh, and yet we work a lot in the lab in Oxford, um, in the psychology department, on the factors that affect our experience of wine, of coffee, of beer, of spirits, of orange juice, it could be. We're kind of agnostic about the, the materials we work with. Uh, but today I want to tell you a bit about the kind of work that we do, uh, mostly funded by industry, and I'll give you a few examples. We have people in the lab who've worked with uh, Nespresso, who we just heard about. Uh, we've worked with Starbucks, uh, with Lilani, tw uh, Twinings, uh, Kraft, uh, uh, Mars and beyond, and even with uh, local baristas we come across who have int in intuitions about what the factors that affect the taste of coffee, and we turn that into experiments to see just how much of an impact that everything else, everything outside the glass or the cup has on the experience. So I want to bring together kind of the evidence uh, that we've come across on the sensory factors uh, that affect uh, that cup of coffee you see there. Uh, and if we were that way inclined, uh, we could stick somebody in a brain scanner and try and see whereabouts kind of the reward value and the enjoyment uh, of a great cup of coffee uh, comes from. And it would be this little bit you see lighted up there um, between the eyes and a little bit back, the orbitofrontal cortex, or the OFC, kind of the reward center of the brain that you'll often see in sort of newspaper articles about uh, neuromarketing. Um, and if one looks a little bit more closely at what's going in in that reward center of the brain, uh, then you find it's a, a hub for kind of integrating sensations uh, integrating what we taste with what we smell, combining that perhaps with, with the sound of the crema bursting in the glass, uh, certainly with textural cues in the mouth um, and with visual cues as well. So all the sense, all our sensory experience uh, of coffee comes together here and in other places. And what we're experts in in Oxford is trying to understand the rules that combine the senses. And it's our opinion, uh, and it's the opinion of many of those that we work with, uh, um, and go to conferences together with, that the senses aren't separate. They might be separate on the outside. I can see, I can hear, I can feel, I can taste, I can smell. I have separate organs for each of those senses. And yet in here, in the brain, all those things come together. They come together all the time. And it's only going to be by knowing how the brain combines the senses that we can really understand perception in the glass, uh, uh, in the car, wherever we might be studying things. And so what we do in our research is try and figure out how changing what somebody feels can change what they smell. By changing what they smell, we can change what they see. And by changing what they see, we can change what they taste. All the senses come together in sometimes surprising ways that psychology and neuroscience are starting to unravel. And it's an excitement and challenge for us to try and take those neuroscience insights and think about how they can apply uh, to sailing better coffee, say. So I'm going to show you, um, and we all think, nah, nah, maybe you can fool people in the labs, but I wouldn't be fooled. I can keep my senses separate. I can see stuff, I can smell things, and I can taste them, and I can keep those sensations uh, apart. Uh, that's not the case, um, and to try and demonstrate that, I could pick one of a whole host of illusions, but I'll just pick the one that you're going to see in a second, uh, of a guy speaking to you. And what I want you to do is think about what the person on the left of the screen is saying. What is the information that is going into your ears? And you should hear something like, ba, ba, ba. Good. Now look at the face on the right of the screen and think about what do you hear going in your ears. Suddenly, it's different. Suddenly, now your brain is telling you the person is saying da or da. And now whenever you look to the left, you'll hear one sound going in your ears. Look to the right and it changes. It's always the same sound. Your brain is combining what it sees and what it hears and changing your experience. If you close your eyes, you can tell the real sound is bar. But once you open your eyes again and look at the face on the right, you cannot stop your brain from combining, from integrating. So even though you know you're being fooled, and I've been watching this video for 20 years now, I'm fooled as much as the rest of you. Our brain combines the senses and only gives us access on the screen or in the glass to the results of that integration. And if you know something about how that integration takes place, maybe you are in a better place. 
So um, the senses, they integrate um, in interesting ways. Let's have a look, look at how each of the senses contributes, can contribute to the coffee tasting experience and how some of these interactions play out in the glass. I guess we have to start in the mouth because everyone talks about the taste of coffee. And we all get confused, as we heard this morning, between taste and flavor. Taste, I, being, I guess, being technically just uh, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, uh, umami, and so on, all detected by the tongue but all the interesting, the nutty, the roasted flavors, in fact, coming from our nose, but being ventriloquized into the mouth. So we experience it here, but we detect it up here, a whole lot of psychology uh, in there, and this oral referral. And some people like their coffee strong, some people like it weak. Why is that? Uh, why do coffee preferences differ between individuals? There will be a number of factors behind that, partly you know, what your mother was eating when she was pregnant with you in the womb. We're learning our taste preferences from the very first days. And beyond that, probably, uh, the state of our tongue also has some impact on our preference for bitter-tasting foods and when in life uh, we started to appreciate coffee. So if you have a tongue uh, like the one that you see on the top of the screen here with flabby taste buds, um, widely distributed, you won't be able to taste certain things. You're a non-taster. Uh, others who have a tongue like the one you see on the bottom, stained blue with a bit of food dye, uh, have far more taste buds and they'll be sensitive, they're super tasters, who are very sensitive to certain bitter compounds. And if you don't know which you are, what sort of tongue you have, you could go and buy some food dye or come to the discussion forum tomorrow and I have some, an easier way of showing in which taste world you live um, and why that may matter to you. So we live in te different taste worlds and that's part of the explanation for maybe why things uh, taste different. But taste is, is so much more than just what's going on on your tongue. Uh, we've done work with designers uh, and material scientists on spoons. Could be coffee spoons. And you think, why? You know, so much innovation going on in, in cuisine these days. But why does everyone eat with the same stainless steel or silver knife, fork, and spoon? Go back 100, 200 years. People had all sorts of materials, bone and porcelain and all sorts of uh, wood for their spoons. Nowadays, there's a far more limited range uh, and we've been working with the material scientists to create spoons, copper, gold, zinc, and stainless steel, I think, there in front of you, uh, and get people to taste foods from a spoon, as for some of those coffee drinkers who'd like their spoon and move it around to get the, get the crema on the, on the spoon. If you're one of those kind of coffee drinkers, then you may get taste also from the spoon. And we find that when people eat, the, eat or drink the same foods from a teaspoon or coffee spoon, as we change the material, even if you can't see that material because your, your eyes are closed, it conveys a taste to that which you are tasting. Zinc uh, and um, copper, for example, will make foods taste a little bit more bitter. Uh, so taste is not just what's happening on the tongue, but each time you stick that spoon in your mouth, you're looking at some number of million molecules, and they can convey some taste properties uh, to your experience. Beyond that, I guess, uh, there's a smell, the aroma of coffee, and that is probably the most important sense when it comes to driving flavor experiences. I wouldn't want to put a number on it, uh, but you'll see the number in the press and in various flavor books that maybe 80 to 95% of our flavor experience, and this may be more so true for coffee than other things, really comes from uh, the nose. And here there are all sorts of challenges about why it is that for most foods, when we sniff them orthonasally on the plate or in the glass, they may tell what taste once, smell wonderful. They may set up expectations of a great tasting uh, experience to come. Uh, and when we actually taste that product, our orthonasal impression is the same as the retronasal flavor we get as we breathe out on eating. Coffee, I guess, is one of the unusual ones where things are a little bit different. And there are many consumers out there who would say, yes, this coffee has such a great smell. I love it. And then I taste it, and it's kind of disappointing. It rarely, I think, goes uh, the other way, and there are questions here. What is it about coffee? Is it something about the extraction of certain volatiles in the mouth? I'm not sure of the answer, but it's kind of an interesting uh, foodstuffs for that uh, very reason. So we work a little uh, on the smell, the taste, the combination, and the psychology behind the two. Um, but we also work far beyond that, um, and other factors that influence the experience of drinking coffee. And this study that's uh, still under review, I should say, uh, was inspired by talk with a barista in Melbourne who said he'd noticed that his, his customers, would, uh, clients, would, would, um, would have different responses to the lattes he made depending on the cup in which he served them. Uh, his intuition was uh, that when the uh, latte was served in the white mug, it tasted more bitter, his customers would say. Uh, in fact, we've been putting that intuition to the test 
And we do find here the three different mugs uh, in which we served uh, uh, hot lattes to our participants. Um, and we can see from the intensity of the flavor bars shown at the top, not quite matching up one to one, but the color tells you all you need to know, that indeed serving the uh, hot latte from the white mug did give rise to higher flavor intensity ratings when exactly the same drink was served from the clear glass or from the blue mug. Small scale study thus far, but it starts to make you think there's more uh, uh, to flavor than what's in the coffee mug or glass. All these external extrinsic factors can have some impact. And James might say, I can remember the last time I spoke to James a few years ago, and he sat me down after my talk and said, yes, yes, this is all very interesting and impressive stuff, but would it make a real step change in people's experience? If you had two cups side by side, would they say, ah, that one tastes different from the other? Some of these effects are like that. This one, perhaps not. Um, they're kind of incremental changes and effects and differences, but you add them all up, and you can really change people's experience. And we might go from the color of the cup or from the mug, or if we're working with a restaurant like El Bulli in Spain, we might change the color of the plate. It will change the taste. A lot of research growing there about plateware and glassware and its impact. And go from there to the color of the environment. There are studies out suggesting that if you take people in a winery on the Rhine and change the color of the ambient lighting from red to blue to green to white, it changes their experience of the wine in the black tasting glass. It changes how much they'd be willing to pay. And specifically in the world of coffee, not looking at the hue, but at the overall brightness of the lighting, nice work from uh, Gal and colleagues in, uh, in California, showing that those who like their coffee stronger will tend to drink more of the stuff under bright ambient lighting conditions. Those who like their coffee weaker uh, will in fact drink more if they're drinking it in a dimmer environment, as you see on the left. So things that shouldn't matter to our experience, to our perception, to our preferences, and our, to our drinking behavior, uh, in fact do. And one other one uh, aspect of vision that's important to, to the experience of coffee is this. I've got a scale. The sort of scales we use in our labs are, are a little bit different from the, from, the, from the serious sensory science scales. We use those sometimes. But we also use fun scales like this, uh, the Booba Kiki scale. You've got a round amoeba on the left. You've got an uh, angular shape on the right. I give you something to taste, to smell. Um, and maybe you've got a, sort of a, a, a bitter, dark uh, coffee. And I ask you to put a point somewhere on that scale that matches your taste or flavor or the aroma experience you're having right now. And if I get a bitter coffee, what I'll find is that the majority of people will mark that scale closer to the right-hand side, closer to the angular shape. So coffee isn't literally angular, and yet it feels right somehow to put uh, a bitter taste with angular uh, tasting foods like coffee. And if you know that, then you can th start thinking about expectations not only by thinking about the height of the crema in the glass, which is no doubt important, but then shaking some sort of chocolate shapes onto the top of your uh, coffee. Uh, and what better shape then than the sort of angular star, because that's speaking to your brain, not through language, but it's speaking nonetheless, and setting up expectations about a bitter taste of what's to come. And you can go from the shaking uh, on the top of the coffee cup through to the logos and labels designs that you might have for your brand or for your, your coffee beans or for your coffee shops. And here you can see the Cafriccio chain in um, Spain, I think it is, and they've got that angular star right on the front of their label logo. Uh, probably a good idea, as long as they're serving uh, a bitter brew. Uh, from there, what about touch? Uh, what is it? Oral, somatosensory texture, the crema in the mouth, the, the fats and the oils. But there's also what we feel in our hands. And we do research with restaurants uh, and with packaging producers to show that if you um, give something somebody something to eat or drink in a heavier glass, they will rate it as a better experience. Perhaps not tea, but everything else. It could be yogurts, it could be soups. Uh, if they have a heavy glass or bowl, they'll rate the experience as better. Uh, it's somehow as if our brains can't separate the contents of the glass from the glass itself, and they kind of integrate the two. What we feel about the glass affects our perception of the contents. The same is true in wine bottles. You can fool most people, and in most wine stores, there's a correlation that for every pound you pay, or $1.8 these days, uh, you get eight grams more of glass. There's a correlation in the marketplace for wines, for lipsticks, for many other products. And if you know that, there are ways of conveying notions of quality uh, to the consumer. And beyond the weight of the glass, there's also uh, the feel. There's a really nice social psychology research out there now showing that if you hold a warm object, like a warm drink in your hand, the world will look like a better place people will seem nicer to you. 
Somehow it shouldn't matter, but the temperature in your hand affects your world outlook. Quite how you might use it, I don't know, but it's there. And beyond that, we heard something about the chair. Even the texture of the chair that you're sitting on affects your thinking style. So all these subtle cues are there. Our brain's picking up everything it can about the environment and using it to infer the nature of our experience. Um, and we work, we work not only with sort of the, the um, material scientists, but also with designers uh, and with restaurants like the Fat Duck in Bray, this year the world's number three, according to some rankings. And we're trying to tackle that problem about why so often coffee smells great, but then the experience in mouth can be disappointing. Uh, what could we do about that? So we're working with um, uh, ceramic, ceramicists in order to think about different shapes and feels and textures and weights for the cup, taking inspiration from the kind of the traditional kind of Finnish school of drinking coffee, where you wouldn't drink it from the cup, you'd pour it into the saucer. Does that give you more sort of volatiles? Uh, and what can you do with a spoon? Not just the material of the spoon, but can we turn it into a, a, a signature um, stirring device like you see on the bottom right from the El Bulli restaurant? Something that you can start to draw shapes in, you can play with your food and draw patterns on the top of your uh, uh, crema should you so desire. A lot of work being done there, a lot of interest, all to try and make that coffee drinking experience uh, better. Um, but I want to finish by thinking about sound, because sound is the forgotten flavor sense. A taste, smell, yes, vision perhaps, touch, of course, but sound, no one ever thinks about that. But your brain does, and it plays a key role in the experience. And this is where some of the work with Nespresso, with some of the uh, students who have been working in my lab in Oxford, I've been looking at your expectations of coffee depending on the sound that the coffee machine makes uh, when it makes a coffee for you. Shouldn't matter, but again, as soon as you hear that, you're like one of Pavlov's dogs. You start salivating, expecting the quality of the contents of the cup and those expectations, to some degree, anchor your subsequent experience. So that whole multi-sensory experience of the coffee uh, is beyond what's in the glass, uh, the cup itself. It's the whole environment, the chair you're sitting on, the level of the lighting, its color, and the sound in the background. And if you want, then, if you know how important the sound of the coffee cup is, you think, oh, I want to emphasize that in store. And here there's kind of the challenge, the playoff between the fact that in many a popular restaurant these days, I mean, there are the New York restaurant critics who give their restaurant reviews together with a sound decibel reading. You say, four out of five for the food, 90 decibels I couldn't hear myself eat. Um, and if you measure those sort of sound levels in many popular eating and drinking locations, you're looking at about 90 uh, decibels, the same as you get at 35,000 feet, an environment that we know suppresses taste and flavor perception. So you, know, you want to do what you can to take away, the, take away the distracting noise and make sure you have uh, the good noise. Um, what is the good noise that you want? I think there are two approaches here. One is, the, it comes from this dish, the sound of the sea seafood dish, the signature dish on the Fat Duck restaurant for the last seven years now, uh, one that we worked on with Heston Blumenthal, where the dish comes to the table with, with sand and foam and seaweed and some seafood hopefully tucked away underneath, as you see on the right. That comes to the table uh, with, in one hand. The waiter brings on the other hand a pair of headphones that dribble out of a conch shell. I recommend you put your headphones in uh, before you taste the sound of the sea. Uh, and when you do that, you hear the sounds you just heard, the waves gently um, crashing on the beach, the seagulls overhead, and suddenly, tables of erstwhile talkative diners are silent. Their attention is just on the plate. And by focusing your attention on what you're tasting, food tastes better. And if you're trying to sell seafood on the outskirts of Slough, kind of by just outside London, then having all these sensory cues you can to capture the, the, the sounds and smells of Provence or the Mediterranean, really do make that seafood taste significantly better, but no more salty. Uh, so this is a dish that kind of show, tells you both about the importance of sound to our flavor experiences, but also about the use of technology. In this case, it's the technology of the chef being brought to your table. But we want to democratize this process and think about how anybody could enhance their flavor experiences through playing the right uh, sort of sound. And the first attempt here comes from uh, Rasmus uh, in the Nor Norwegian Barista Championships 2011, he'd obviously tried or heard about the sound of the sea seafood dish, and there was kind of a coffee uh, beverage competition where uh, he made a coffee and apple juice combo. I'm not sure if that would 
would match or not, maybe. Um, and he has some headphones, and people in the competition would, would, would taste his coffee-apple uh, combo while listening to the sound of carbonation. Uh, research in the lab would say it's perhaps not the best combination, but the idea was right. Um, he didn't win that year, but the next two, apparently, uh, he did. But what might be better um, is to think not just about... I mean, coffee doesn't have a sound. You have the, do, you, do you play the sound uh, 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 of the coffee trees and the leaves, or is it something else? Or do you look for inspiration and more in synesthesia? And if you go back through classical uh, musical repertoire, then you can see things like uh, Bach's Coffee Cantata. Did he capture something about the taste of the coffee in the notes and the instruments that he chose for this piece? Uh, perhaps, um, but there are ways now to really test this empirically and to take foods and by changing the notes and the instruments that you hear while tasting or drinking that product, change the experience. And this is shown from the House of Wolf restaurant in um, North London. We have a bitter sweet food. I guess it could be a coffee with a bit of sugar. In this case, it's a bittersweet dark chocolate toffee. Uh, and you'll see there is one course for each sense. And down near the bottom, it's a sonic cake pop, the sound course. If you want to make your dessert sweeter, dial 0845 207 something something. If your dessert's uh, too, too sweet, you want a bit more bitterness in there, dial a different telephone number. And what happens? Uh, when you dial those numbers, is you either hear this soundtrack. Um, I'm thinking, is that bitter? Is it sweet? Um, of course, bitterness and sweetness do not literally have a sound, and yet the majority of people uh, will judge this as, uh, as one taste, but... This has a different taste. Is this sweet? Is it bitter? Sweet. It's got to be sweet. And we've got hundreds, uh, maybe even thousands of people now who say that's a sweet sound. The other one was the, the lower notes uh, were more, were more um, uh, uh, bitter. And when we give people a bitter sweet food, like a chocolate, like a toffee, in the lab or in the restaurant, then their experience has changed by about 5 or 10%. Uh, it'll knock a few people off their chairs, not everyone, but as a group level, there's a significant effect there. And now we're using handheld technology to enhance the experience. People have all got this technology in their pockets, and we can use it. And this is what's happening now, um, uh, uh, where our work with uh, Starbucks came in, who in 2010 were launching this sort of uh, Starbucks beer uh, coffee for at-home drinking. They wanted to say, give the Starbucks experience at home, how to do so, or well, we did some work with people tasting coffee, having to think of what instrument, what pitch of sound matched uh, the taste and flavor experience. And we found, again, it's that bitter notes matched with low pitch. Those results from the lab were passed to a composer who created this soundtrack that people could download and hence drink their coffee and listen to this. You might like the music, uh, you might not. Um, there's always kind of a mix of the science and the creativity here, but the basic approach that you can enhance flavor perception, change the experience, draw people's attention to high notes, to low notes, um, through sound is uh, an exciting one that Starbucks had in 2010. And of this year, we'll be working with, with wine companies. We'll have 3,000 people drinking wine on the Thames next week, and we'll be changing the music, changing the lighting, and changing the taste. Uh, we're we're doing work with whiskey companies, another complex kind of uh, aroma profile, and there, by changing the environment in which they drink that whiskey, we can get a 20% change in their experience of the nose, of the sweetness on the palate, or of the aftertaste. Uh, it's all very exciting to us, but I've hopefully given, you, hopefully given you a sense of how there's so much more uh, to what's in the cup uh, than what's in the, cup, in the cup. It involves what we hear, what we see, what we smell, what we taste, and what we feel. And those senses come together often in ways that are automatically bound, which we can't necessarily pull apart, and very often we're not aware of, but which the techniques of psychological and neuroscience, I think, do give us a, a good access to demonstrating their importance and how to use them together with composers, uh, ceramicists, uh, product manufacturers and environment engineers to create the ultimate uh, coffee drinking experience. Thank you very much.